Right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, what I'd like to do today in this very brief talk is a small social revolution, I hope. As you can see behind me, uh, my talk is about celebrating failure. And, and when you say failure, very often people just switch off. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to suggest today that there are useful failures and not so useful failures. And I'd like to try and help you understand how we can manage our failures. So, I'll begin with a very simple question. The simple question is, who makes mistakes? Everybody, absolutely. Human beings make mistakes. All human beings make mistakes. There are no exceptions. So, if it's inevitable for human beings to make mistakes, why is it that every single error that we make, we tend to over-exaggerate and see as a disaster? We can't get there. We'll never get there. It's as if an error, a mistake, a failure means no success. It's as if in our brains we've got this idea of a spectrum. On one side you have success, and on the other side there's failure. But what I'd like to suggest is that's not the case. And if we're able to understand failure and failing well, and create a failing well culture, well then we can create the best path to success. Okay, but to do that, unfortunately, we have to make a very big uh, shift in our perspectives. Because it's quite difficult, it's not easy to start thinking positively about failures. We need to embrace failures. What we tend to do is we tend to ignore them, or hide them. Yeah, just pretend they're not happening. If we do that, we're unable to take the information that comes from mistakes, and we're unable to take this information and use it well on our path to success. Um, Basically, I'm going to give you this very simple uh, quotation from Adolf Huxley. I like it very much. Experience is not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. In other words, we need to use what happens and apply what happens rather than pretending something that goes wrong hasn't happened. And I'd like to begin by showing you that this already exists by taking a particular industry that is failure-obsessive. Everything it does is linked to failure. And so it's part of its culture. Why? Well, because if it doesn't manage the small mistakes, then unfortunately, uh, the, what can I say, the result is very, very strong. It's the nuclear industry. They have the safest safety record of any industry, and just as well. Because if they make a big mistake, a disaster, then many people are killed across continents, and also it's a long-term disaster. So what have they done? They've got obsessive about mistakes. They've started to understand that using mistakes in order to stop disasters is the only way to keep safety an absolute premium. I'll just show you, just very briefly, four main, what can I say, summaries that they've come up with. Um, first one. Everyone, everyone is responsible for the mistakes. Everyone is responsible as they're part of the process. Now, once you've understood that everyone's responsible, then it gets easier to create an open environment where people are communicating openly about what's gone right and what's gone wrong as well. That takes us on to the third idea, and the third idea is questioning. It doesn't matter who tells you to do something. It doesn't matter how often the process has been followed. You can always question that person if the idea is to try and understand and keep safety high. And finally, everything that comes out, especially the mistakes, are shared. You can notice that this is from the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. What does that mean? It's a nationwide, sorry, a sector-wide idea. In other words, we don't keep our information to ourselves. We share it amongst everyone, all the competitors. Now, that's pretty interesting. But where's the link between mistakes and disasters? Well, to do that, I'm going to show you this. This is the accident pyramid. It comes from a, a very different sector, the insurance sector. The insurance sector basically, well, it's uh, based on failure, yeah? It has business from failure. Um, this pyramid behind me, it's about 100 years old. 
they've updated. What you see on the, uh, on the screen behind me is 2003 figures, something, something like that. What's important is not the exact figure. What's important is the relationship. We'll begin with the yellow pieces, okay? We'll start with first aid. What does first aid mean? It means that, according to this, 300 examples of people going to get um, bandages, medicine, in other words, they've cut their finger, they're not feeling well, from the company, okay? So the company administers medicines uh, and, uh, and so on to help people. Next one up, 30, severe accidents. How do companies see a severe accident? Well, usually, usually, it means that you've spent at least one day away from work. But you can imagine that's a wide range of accidents. So it could be breaking your leg, it could be a serious illness, and so on. And unfortunately, one at the top is fatality, and fatality means fatality. Now, why all of this, and why in yellow? Well, yellow represents the reported incidents. In other words, Companies looking at the number of accidents are trying to understand how can we bring that down? How's it possible to bring that down, especially the severe accidents and fatalities? We can have processes, uh, we can have rules, but how can we really bring it down? How can we make a difference? And the answer is the big numbers at the bottom. So let's have a look. We'll begin with the biggest number, 300,000. Those are risky behaviors. In other words, doing something when you shouldn't really be doing it. So you're tired, you're stressed out, you're not concentrated. And the next one up, 3,000, well, that's near misses. In other words, a chain of risky behaviors, one, two, three, four, that would be a disaster unless it were for luck. So we were lucky not to have a disaster. Okay, so that's the idea. And the basic idea is, if we can manage the 3,000 and the 300,000, we can reduce the really tough things in the yellow. That's the idea, but, and here's the big but. In order to be able to manage the big numbers at the bottom, we need people to tell us. Because in the white, it's the not reported. It's people keeping mistakes to themselves. Now I thought, okay, that's interesting. That's about industries, but can we apply this to everything, to life? And it turns out we can. We can apply this accident pyramid to anything. So I decided to apply it to something, a disaster I brought for you, which is my marriage, okay? Now, before, before we have a look at my marriage in terms of the accident pyramid, I'm just gonna ask, is anyone else in the audience, have you ever finished a long-term relationship? If you have, just put your, your hand in the air, just so I understand, fantastic. Oh, just people in the front, apparently, not in the back. Okay, good. Okay. So, if you have ever finished a long-term relationship, you can play along with me, okay? The others, you're just gonna have to uh, imagine. So, let's begin. My personal accident pyramid. Um, risky behaviors, 300,000. Well, that's a lot. Uh, examples, well, it could be drinking the beer directly out of the bottle. It could be forgetting my mother-in-law's birthday. It could be paying electricity bill late, so I have to pay extra, something like that, okay? Fine. Next one up, near misses. Well, that's a chain of risky behaviors where basically there would be a big argument if it were not for the situation. So maybe my wife and myself, we find ourselves in a public place, in a theater, so we can't argue, or in front of my parents. Okay, that's the basic idea. Let's go up to 300. Oh, well, that's when there's screaming arguments, okay? So that's when there's, what can I say, a difference of opinion, I think, is what it's saying. Okay. We go up to 30. 30 I put out as walking out of the house, but you can also include, uh, if you wish, slamming doors and so on. And finally, number one, well, that's a letter from her lawyer saying, I want a separation. <laughs> okay. So, I thought, well, how did that happen there? I mean, we didn't get married for us to get divorced, right? So how, how did that happen? And it turns out that the best way for me to have manage this disaster is exactly the same ideas that the nuclear industry had. That's amazing. Everyone in the relationship is responsible for the process. Openness means open communication, and so giving feedback, questioning whatever it is is useful, and finally, constant learning in order to help yourself get to, in this case, a successful situation. So, 
If it's so obvious, why don't we do it? Well, David Ledbetter uh, spoke about you are what you share. In an in interconnected world, there is so much potential for sharing, but we're afraid of sharing information. We're afraid either in relationships or uh, in, in a much bigger situation in organizations as well. Why is that happening? Well, I am going to suggest that it's a question of timing. There's um, a basic idea that short term is ever more important. In other words, you're looking just at the next quarter. What's happening at the next quarter? We're not looking ahead enough. And short termism has permeated society. But this is a problem, because basically at this point, where's the innovation coming from? Where's the learning coming from? Where's showing initiative coming from? Basically, ladies and gentlemen, very often, it seems that we're paid to not make mistakes. But, you know, if you're paid to not make mistakes, then how are we going to go forward? How's that possible? And a correlation to not making mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, is the blame culture. The blame culture, when there is a mistake, is this finger pointing. It's your fault. And so what we can do is we can put the responsibility onto a person. We can attribute the problems to a person. But does that mean the problems have gone away? Probably not. Probably not. What all of this has caused, ladies and gentlemen, is if I make a mistake, it's probably best for me to shut up, to keep quiet. And this creates cover-ups. And what do cover-ups do? Well, cover-ups create the potential for systemic disasters. That's the fatality at the top. I'll give you some examples. 1986, um, this is a technological uh, disaster. Uh, spaceship, uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Um, logistics, how about the Denver International Airport uh, baggage handling, automatic baggage handling system? It went more than half a million dollars over budget. It failed to deliver for 10 years, and finally it was stopped. Um, a little bit more recent, the environmental disaster that came out of the deep water horizon. All of these are systemic disasters, but maybe the biggest one, ladies and gentlemen, is something we're living through right now, which is the financial crack. What you can see behind me is uh, The Economist. The Economist um, front cover. Uh, but my question to you is, which year do you think this is? 2008? 2010? Now, actually, unfortunately, it's November 1997. You see, we're not very good at learning from failures. We tend to sort of forget them, ignore them. Let me try and put everything together, ladies and gentlemen, in synthesis. Well, in a perfect world, ladies and gentlemen, everything would go right, and we'd understand. And that would be wonderful. But we don't live in a perfect world. Let's take the opposite. I do something, it doesn't go right, and I don't understand why. And probably I don't want to understand why, because failing is bad. So I'll just forget it. Okay? Short term, short term pressure, ladies and gentlemen, makes us feel that what's come up now is the answer. In other words, you're successful, but it's not important how or why you were successful. And very often, short-termism means you were lucky. You were lucky. Well, that's good for the immediate result, but there's a problem. And the problem is, you don't know how to repeat it. And probably what we're doing is, we're sowing the seeds to an eventual disaster. So, what I'm going to suggest this afternoon is, why not think about short-term mistakes being an important part of learning to get to the overall goal? In other words, shifting, moving from this idea of successful, unsuccessful, to why we are successful or unsuccessful. That's the basic idea. So, let me put it all together. What have I learned from failure? I've learned these things here. First, failing well means learning, especially the difficult feedback. In fact, if you can take something from the difficult feedback, that's usually the most important information. Second one, if you're too short-term about how you see things, you're probably creating, without knowing it, the basis for a long-term disaster. 
Third, accountability doesn't mean punishing people. It means understanding that you're part of the process. And finally, if we can create a no-blame culture, then basically we automatically have more openness. So in other words, there's much more information that comes out. Now, I can't do this by myself. I can't create a failing well culture by myself. So I need some activists, and I thought I'd start with 600 people today. Okay, so I know you're busy today. So as of tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, let's all start failing well. Thank you very much. Now, team, I have uh, one question. So uh, we're in the European Western society, and most of your examples, nuclear and so on, were from this society, this culture. Do these messages apply across cultures? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, in terms of short-termism, so this idea of just looking at the next quarter, that's very much an idea of, uh, of the Western world. But the idea of cover-ups is worldwide. Uh, it, it links to how much information is power if you retain it or you share it. But let's say what's underlying everything, so in other words, that goes across cultures, is the idea of embarrassment and shame, which changes from culture to culture. So in the Eastern cultures, shame would be looking bad in front of the group, whilst generally in the West, it's shame feeling I'm unable to do something the individual. So yes, the basic idea, but how we would change that, that's going to change from, from culture to culture. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Tim you. Back, sir.